ways to bring Mother Nature inside coming up right after this. I'm Alan Smith, welcome to the show. Well, burr, it's cold outside. Winter's in full swing, but I thought we'd take a look at bringing the garden indoors. Last summer, I visited a friend out in the Delta at a plantation house where he set a beautiful table setting. And just wait till you see the exquisite china and flowers. I'll also show you a few of my house plants and give you a few tips on planting herbs if you're new to gardening. Plus, we'll get tips on how to freshen up a room, and don't forget about the recipe. We're gonna make this delicious cheesecake. Well, as you can see, we have a lot to cover in today's show. As soon as we come back after the break, we're gonna head out to the Arkansas Delta. I'm gonna show you something really special, so stay tuned. This past summer, I headed to the Arkansas Delta where I had a chance to visit beautiful 19th century Marles Gate Plantation. Homeowner David Garner talked to me about his amazing table setting. David, I don't think I have ever seen the table so beautiful. It looks so abundant. Thank you, I appreciate that. Well, and the flower arrangement, it looks like most of the flowers came out of the garden. Old and tattered garden. Well, it's certainly very opulent. And I have to say that the spine through the center of the silver is exquisite. Thank you. Plateaus were, well, a creation to elevate something pretty. And nowadays, the plateaus are really more highly sought after than whatever was on top of them. But it anchors uh, your, your table, and also you notice it's mirrored, of course, and reflected all the candlelight. The centerpiece, we tried to get it to reflect the pattern on the old Paris porcelain, because if you uh, look at it closely, uh, all the tr a lot of true southern flowers that we're quite acquainted with here in the, in the Delta. And what's so fascinating about the plates, each one has some type of insect or bird on each plate. Is there a favorite piece? I mean, there's so many different forms and shapes and colors here. One of the most unusual pieces, I think, that on the table today is, is the, the wine jug. It's a wonderful bisque piece. Uh, of course, you can see at one time it was gilted. Of course, it's worn out because people physically use those, but it was passed around by the the, the guests themselves are by the servants, of course, and to pour wine. Here at the head of the table, I, I love this salt cellar with the little tiny salt spoon. Those were very, very popular because salt was so very expensive. Uh, salt shakers didn't come into vogue to much, much later. This one by Jacques Petit is a very rare one. He made a companion to that, one with leopards and one with monkeys. Well, it just shows a, a great deal of imagination and whimsy. Definitely. Now, let's talk a little bit about the place setting because uh, clearly you can get an indication as a visitor what number of courses you're about to uh, enjoy yes. by, based on the flatware. Exactly. Of course, a dinner party was the entertainment uh, for the So they evening. went on for a long for time? For hours and hours. Three hours was a short dinner party. Uh, and you had numerous courses, and they did not rush courses like we do today. Uh, you know, people think if this course is not up on top of another course, it's not good service. That's not correct. It should be leisurely done. And so you'd start out with something green, something a salad thing, or fresh asparaguses, or something of that nature. Maybe go to a heavy gumbo with the big gumbo spoons. And you might go into a, like a, a fowl or a, a fish course or venison or something of this nature. And then for a main course, whatever, you're, maybe a roast pork or something of this nature. And then the finish up, of course, with the Royal Crown Derby uh, fruit service because it was so customary, like I said earlier, to, to not only after you have your podocrems removed and things of this nature and you've had that uh, heavy, creamy dessert, you'd actually consume the centerpieces along with your pettifores. Well, David, it is certainly an outstanding collection. Thank you. I appreciate it and I love my beautiful things, but I love it most before a dinner party to come in here in the evening just before sunset and see everything all by candlelight. That's when it's absolutely beautiful. After the break, we'll talk about indoor house plants and ways to freshen up a room. So stay with us. An outdoor living space like this porch is the perfect environment for house plants. They've enjoyed a life out here all through the late spring, summer, and into the early fall, but now it's time for me to start thinking about bringing them back indoors. You see, houseplants can add a certain vitality to really any room at home. Whether you purchase new houseplants or bring in existing plants that have spent summer vacation outside, I have a few tips that will help them thrive. 
If you're returning house plants to the indoors from your garden, be sure to give them a good bath. You just gently want to wash the leaves with some mild soap and warm water. You see, this will help them breathe and respond better to light. Now, after you wash your plant, spray them with an insecticidal soap to ensure that you're not bringing in any of those little pesky hitchhikers. Now, as to when to move house plants in, I follow a very simple rule of thumb. When the average nighttime temperature is similar to the temperature inside the home, that's when I start taking them inside. You know, I think so often if we look at a house plant and we see that it's tired, weak, or the leaves are yellowing, we automatically think, hey, we need to feed it. It's time to apply more fertilizer. You need to be careful with that. You see, if plants aren't in an active growth phase, and when they're out on a porch like this and during the summer, they are in an active growth phase, but if they're not, and you apply fertilizer, you can often damage the roots of the plant. You see, fertilizer isn't always the cure. You see, generally, most house plants will do just fine being fed about every three to six months. And when I feed a plant, I use a liquid fertilizer with a 5-10-5 ratio. Overwatering is another way we tend to kill plants with kindness. When our heat is on in our homes, our plants can dry out much sooner. So you may want to check them and add a little extra water, but be careful. Too much water can actually suffocate the roots. Also during the winter, the dry air in our homes can be a problem to plants. One of the simplest ways to increase the moisture in the air immediately around the plant is to place the container on a saucer of gravel and water. As the water evaporates, it'll bathe the leaves of the plant in higher humidity. You just want to make sure that the bottom of the container is sitting on the gravel above the water line. Hopefully by following a few of these basic tips, you'll have healthier and happier house plants through the colder months. This past spring, my friend and interior designer, Lindsay Coral Harper, was here for the weekend. She shared a few really good tips with me on how to freshen up the decor in the front parlor. All right, you think it'll fit back here? Yeah, I think it's gonna work. All right, good. Yeah, I love the cording on that. These slip covers look great. It's all in the details. <laughs> well, you know, slip covers are a wonderful way to change out a room for a season, aren't they? It's very easy, and it totally transforms any room. Do you use slip covers a lot in your design work? I do. It's a great way to go from a winter and fall look to spring summer. Well, the lift these have given this room from winter to spring is really fantastic. It's really light in the room. It makes a big difference. Now, when do you use slip covers? Is there a particular situation where you might say, hey, this, this room could really afford slip covers? I think any room where there's a lot of activity, a great room, a family room, where there are going to be a lot of people. Well, this room certainly gets a lot of use. Mm -hmm. And you know, back in the winter, we had a rug rolled down over the top of this jute rug. And of course, these were chocolate brown and the transformation is really quite exceptional. Yeah, it's quite nice and it makes a big difference. Just a few things here and there. But you know, a lot of little things add up to that big change, like these wonderful pillows you made. Exactly. Lindsay, these are fantastic. Thank you. I, I wouldn't have thought of this color, this sort of raspberry color, but it's, it's terrific. Well, that's what I think you want to do. You actually don't want to get too matchy-matchy. It's nice to find the darkest or deepest hue in the room and kind of play that up. So you found this sort of deep pink or a raspberry color in the patterned club chairs. Exactly. And then I just wanted to play that up because it's a nice pop of color. You just want a little bit of it, but it goes a long way. Now tell me about this pillow because I love this pattern on, on this one and the fringe. Isn't that a fun color combination? It's great. And I love to do this. I love to do a nice contrast with the texture, do a contrast color on the outside. It makes a big difference and something a little bit unexpected. I have to say it's interesting to me how you think about a room as a designer. Mm -hmm. You know, once you're thinking about the colors of the fabric and these different fabrics on a single piece of furniture, but you're also having to think about how that fits into the broader context of the room. Right, you do have to think about the big picture, but you don't want to get overwhelmed. So for me, a common thread is to kind of start with the basics and that's color. I see, and in this case, you took a, a single color, that, that dark sort of raspberry, yeah. and played on it back and forth. Yeah, it's just such a beautiful color, and you already had it here in the room, so I just wanted to play up with that. Well, I've grown those raspberry or really fuchsia-colored tulips, well, for years, but I've never used them in this room. They're really just so beautiful. This color's so nice and intense, and it just works perfectly with your palette. I just can't believe how the color vibration, it's just, uh, it really does resonate with everything in the room. It's really nice. The contrast is, is really great. Well, I love the fact that you drug out that old uh, tulip <laughs> vase. I wouldn't have thought about using it here on this coffee table. It's great. I think the proportion is nice and the colors are 
again, they're really great. It really is amazing what you can do by just using some slip covers, some pillows, and, and just bringing some fresh flowers into it. A few easy steps and you can easily transform a room. And I need to have you come more often to go through the attic and find <laughs> things like that and put them back to work. I'm happy to. After the break, we'll talk about the best herbs for beginners to plant, so stay tuned. If you're thinking about growing some of your own food for the first time, and you're a beginner, I would suggest that you try something easy, something that you'll be successful with, and that's herbs. Anybody can grow them. All you need is full sun, well-drained soils, consistent moisture, and a little fertilizer from time to time. And just look how healthy and beautiful these are in containers here. Now, three very versatile herbs you might want to consider are rosemary, onion chives, and basil. I've started with three basic terracotta containers and added a good quality soil made for vegetable and herb gardening. I'm using Bonnie herbs that are grown in biodegradable peat pots made from natural and recycled materials. The neat thing about them is that you can plant the pots with the plant. This reduces transplantation shock and there are no nursery containers to throw away. So after planting each herb in their own containers, be sure to give them plenty of water and sunshine. Now you'll find rosemary prefers a warm, sunny, and dry environment. You can cut rosemary stems at any time. The fragrant blooms are also edible. In the kitchen, I love to use rosemary to season roasted chicken. Now take a look at these onion chives. You see they're a grassy looking perennial with onion flavored leaves and purple blooms. The mild onion flavor is a tasty addition to any savory dish. You'll find chives are not finicky and they'll tolerate some neglect but will do best when you don't completely ignore them. And then of course there's basil, and you'll find it can't stand cold weather. So if you have a basil plant indoors, don't set it outside until two weeks after the last frost date in your area. Be sure to water them deeply during dry spells, especially if planted in containers. I love fresh basil with sliced tomatoes. These are just a few herbs for you to think about growing. I hope you'll give some of them a try. Okay, it's time to take one more short break. When we return, I'll show you how to make this delicious cheesecake, so stay tuned with us. Now, what we're gonna start out with, we're gonna start out with cream cheese. Now what I have here is a pound and a half, and that's um, three one pound uh, sticks of cream cheese. And then I'm taking a half a cup of sour cream, it goes in. And I'm gonna get that started. And now what I'm gonna do is take this honey and fold it in. And there's three quarters cups of honey. And what you wanna do is you want this to run long enough to where it's all smooth. You don't want any clumps. Honey is so beautiful. It has that gorgeous golden color. Now that's going to take a few minutes for all that to blend together. It looks really smooth, so I think I'm going to stop and just let you see how smooth and creamy this is. Really yummy. Mm, very good. Okay, so I'm going to lower this because it's time to add the eggs, and I'm going to add six egg yolks. I've got one tablespoon of vanilla, I have one tablespoon of orange zest, and I've been working on a tablespoon of orange, or lemon zest, I should say, right here, and I'm adding that. And it's time to mix all that together. Well, there we go. All right, that looks pretty good. <clears throat> okay, now we want to take the egg whites. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just take this mixer and whip these eggs till they make a meringue. Okay, you can kind of see that we've got some peaks occurring there, which is pretty good. I'm ready to start adding the sugar, and I've got about a fourth of a cup here, so I'm gonna... What I'm gonna do is gradually add the sugar. You just want to do this until 
makes a nice meringue. Nice and fluffy. Okay, now I'm just introducing the meringue of egg white solution into this batter for the cheesecake. Just doing it gradually, a little bit at a time. Now we're ready to take it out and pour it into the pan and pop it in the oven. Mmm, it's so good. Okay, so I'll pop this in a preheated oven, 350 degrees for about 50 minutes. It'll stay jiggly in the center at the end of 50 minutes. Just turn the oven off and keep the oven door ajar and let it rest in the oven for about three hours. Let it cool off and you're ready to serve. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Hey, anything in today's show, you can pick up on my website. That's pallensmith.com, and that includes that delicious cheesecake recipe. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden, I dream of a bed of flowers. Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh, no, I can't help but smile